One of the things that we really loved about um, what the, the first day that we met the mayor was in December of 2023, and we thought he was going to stay for like a half an hour, but I think he kept us there two and a half, three hours, which I loved. And one of the things he said was, I formed this advisory council. What do you think about it? I'm like, eh, I think it's pretty cool. And he goes, well, I didn't, I didn't bring on like my biggest fans. And I thought, well, that's leadership, quite frankly, if you're willing to hear the other parts too. So what I'm hoping today is the way that we're going to start is we're going to go down the row and um, for the people who are here, and they're going to tell you a little bit about their fire story, and then I have some questions for them. So let's go ahead and get started. By the way, we do have um, Nestor on video, so at the end of the fire story, we'll go ahead and play that video. We do need to re, um, redo the timer. I love a timer, so, okay. So uh, what time of the day it is? In Hawaii, it's morning. So, aloha kako, o o kaliko lehua store. Uh, no hovau ma lea li'i lahaina, uh, no kaupo mai ko ohana, no kakulo mai ko ohana, no honua ula makena mai ko ohana. Uh, aloha, my name is Kaliko Lehua Store. I live in lea li'i lahaina. My ohana comes from kaupo, maua, and naupu'u kaupo. My ohana comes from makena honua ula, as well as kakuloa in uh, the head of the island. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you folks today, and I think what I want to share is what we're sharing right now, right? I got five minutes and four seconds. Okay. Uh, what I want to share is in the early days after the fire, I was a kako or a support to the leaders of Lahaina, and specifically uh, to Zeke Kalua, uh, to Cynthia Lalo, to Amos Lonokailua Hewitt, my mom, Makalapua Kanuha Bankako, Archie Kalepa, uh, Danny Boy Palakiko, Kaike Ahi. And what that looked like was I just did whatever needed to be done. I held a radio, gave a radio, because at the time we recognized that there was no official order of government support. And so what that looked like is we found an empty space to set up camp. And um, we, we recognized that every, every one of the leaders were doing what they needed to do to stand up their community with food, with aid, with medical attention. But there hadn't yet been a, a place where all leaders of Lahaina could meet. And so that's where we came in um, to support, to be a conduit for the mayor. And through the guidance, uh, we all had a mission statement in our own head, but not a collective one. And so we're very grateful because a year later, uh, the gentleman that sat us all down, while well, I was in the back of the room, uh, was Amos Lonokailua Hewitt, and he was voluntold by my mom, Makalapua, that said, boy, you're going to be in charge. And he was really kind of just passing through uh, because he was servicing uh, Napili, uh, another hub up north. And what it looked like was he took out a bunch of flip chart paper and some pens and he made all the leaders sit down who at the time didn't have time to sit. I'm talking to the people that know what I'm talking about. And to, to have a, a leadership sit for any longer than five minutes to talk about a mission statement and to really through cultural, traditional way of, of moderating, of, of getting everybody together, of, of perspective, uh, he was able to get them all to sit and think about what are we doing. And so collectively, we say we are, we are rendering aid, immediate aid, to an entire community. So it didn't matter what culture you were from or ethnicity, but collectively, we were there for the immediate need and to render aid. And so in that conversation, some of us were talking about trailers with modular homes. Some of us were talking about growing trees. Some of us were talking about where do I get the bread and milk from? Some were talking about that helicopter is going to land. It's going to bring food. And Chief Amos said, hold on. And that was hard because transparently we became very offended with him telling us to hold on. <laughs> and um, But in doing so, a year later, Collectively, we all sit in a room today where if we could had to redo this again, we'd be one team to not mess with. And because we had great order. And we were able to identify what we were immediately doing. 
And so this operation, the name of, we became the West Maui Community Aid because we were rendering aid, food, medical, um, and e those immediate needs <clears throat> until such that the government arrived. So we were in operation for 32 days and we had 12 communities that we had organized with initially. And then some of us were returning back to normal life. Not normal life, I should say. The next phase, because we were, we were prepped for that. They said, this is what's going to happen. And it's all going to happen really quick. So we've had to, we had to make adjustments until the government arrived um, to support, to help us stand up and harden these disaster resource centers. And so I share that from that perspective because we for, some of us may not know that and some of us may have forgotten and it's those, initially those heroes in the very beginning to me that I was just the girl that made sure that all the uncles and aunties had food, they had an organized place and they were walking into chaos. And now a year later, somebody's passed me the mic. And so I told Jen when I met her, we all said this when she, when her and your whole entourage walked in. At first I was like, oh man, another group of people are gonna yell at us and gonna tell us what we're not doing and what this person is not doing and where have you been and blah, 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 blah. And she came in and I think all of us just kind of exhaled and I think I might have cried the most because finally somebody could speak our language and somebody could not. I didn't have to be defensive in why I was hanging out with the mayor and why all of a sudden I chose to be on this secret team. And th that was the thing too. People thought we were having secret meetings. We didn't even know what a secret meeting was. Anyway, my time is up, let's go. We're very proud of this endorsement, by the way. <laughs> Lori, do you mind? I love how you said he didn't pick his biggest fans. I did not even know the mayor before the fire. <laughs> but I will say, I am born and raised in Lahaina, and I am a fire survivor. Lahaina and the island of Maui has been having many fires ever since the era of the sugar plantation fields. Ending and at what was once green sugar cane is now dry grass. 2018 was our warning. The fire came from Kaula Valley, more south side of where I live. We had time to escape for this fire. Fortunately, the wind stopped as soon as the fire reached our main road, Lahaina Luna. The escape of my daughter who was 10 at the time. I loaded with all the animals and drove across the street where my uncle went to adult daycare. I ran back and grabbed my uncle and ran him across the street and called the ambulance to pick him up because he couldn't walk. I ran back to my house and kept saying out loud, if it all burns, what are you taking? So I grabbed more things. Lahaina has been on PTSD ever since then. Four or five homes burnt right next to my house. The county water truck saved my house that year. There was no water in the fire hydrant across the street. August 8th, 2023, the fire, early morning, super high winds. I woke up to the noise of people's roof shingles running across my roof like a train. Luckily, my roof was brand new. We had just changed it. If not, it probably would have flown off. Fire trucks went up the hill, but the fire seemed to have been put out, and so we continued to deal with the wind all day, blowing things around and trying to secure things. PTSD made me and my daughter pack a little clothes to just throw in the car for just in case. My important papers, jewelry, and money were in bags left by the door. 2018 was our test run. Our game plan, I needed one since my husband Elton was not home and in the mainland. Things happen for a reason. We believe if he was home, we would have been fighting about leaving my uncle behind and probably got burnt escaping or not even made it at all because hard decisions had to make, be made that day. My daughter would grab the pets and I would grab my uncle. This was the plan. August 8, 2023, in the afternoon, the fire began. I heard the fire trucks go up the hill. I ran out to look and neighbors and I agreed. We will let each other know if we need to go. There was no time. We literally had about five minutes to get out of there. We had solar batteries. So I had the AC running, even though there was no electricity. So we couldn't hear outside, 
or smell how bad the smoke was. I just so happened looked out the window seeing neighbors leaving. I told my daughter, who was 15 at the time, the Gleam Clan is on. She got the leashes on the two dogs, wrangled up the three kittens, and we put them in the pet bag. I took the fire extinguisher, pulled the pin, and went to my uncle's room, where he was just sitting quietly with his back to me. As I unlocked his sliding door for his rescue, I said my quiet goodbye at this time as time stood still and said to myself, the fire department will come and get him. I went back to the escape mode and looked out the sliding door to see if the wind might die down. Yet embers were flying through the garage and now side of the house and the car was right next to it. It was time to go. The wind wasn't gonna stop and we needed to load up. As I finished loading the back, my two feral cats came running up to me screaming to take them. This actually became my most traumatizing moment for me because I had to leave them behind and a big gust came and they ran. We went up around the corner. My daughter called 911 to send someone to get my uncle. I told police there and they were busy directing traffic. We passed a fire truck trying to hook up to the same fire hydrant in 2018 with no water once again. We saw the dark smoke by our house and kept driving and stopping on side in case 911 called needing assistance. We never got a call, so I decided to go. Escaping in the traffic to get to our family house in Waihikuli, we could already see the fire had made it down near town, and the poles were blocking the highway, and that's why it was taking so long. We finally made it to our family's home. We never unpacked. I had my breakdown and was in shock, and I just was on adrenaline and waited for our next move. The fire was coming, so we headed north to our auntie's house in Napili. Five families, seven cars. Three other families were already there. We slept in the car with our pets, no electricity, no cell service, but there was a bathroom and food and water if we needed. Everything was now word of mouth. Word was to go to the Ritz Carlton to get supplies. It was the first time I realized I was not the volunteer, I was the person in need. The next word was boats were coming from Molokai, our ocean side bringing supplies on the lower road. Some of us needed gas, food, water. We even got delivery from others as more supplies came in. In the meantime, you stood in the middle of the road to try and catch cell service from Molokai, trying to call my husband to let him know we were okay, and trying to get a hold of my mom to let her know we were okay, not knowing she had her own escape and where I thought we would now be living had burnt as well. We had to listen to the radio because there was no cell service. It said you couldn't go in and out of Lahaina. Family from Central Side loaded up and came around the north end to bring us things, taking a chance they might get stuck, but bringing whatever supplies they could. A hub was eventually set up at Napili Plaza where you could get food, clothes, everything. A plane actually flew overhead saying there was water, food, and supplies there. And in all this chaos, I thought, so I need to call 911 to ask if they got my uncle? Maybe I could see it on my security cameras. Luckily, Greater Divine intercepted that transaction, and I sadly never got the call, so I only could assume the worst. I just remained numb. Four days later, word was the hotel was housing emergency workers. My cousin, my cousin worked for MPD. Problem was, we had our pets. Honua Kai took us in. I can't even remember if we had to show an ID, definitely no credit card. The room wasn't even cleaned. The visitors had to leave and they didn't have electricity. I didn't care. There was a washing machine, dryer, so I cleaned so we could stay in a room and not in our car. This became our non-congregate shelter. Although grateful, it was traumatizing because we weren't sure how long we could stay, where we would go, and if we would get kicked out or moved by Red Cross. As we are up in the air, we are now dealing with our insurance, speaking to our assigned agent, listing everything we have lost, filling out paperwork. Till this day, I'm still trying to get the maximum amount for my mom's property. And on top of this, we were now going through ROE paperwork, debris cleanup, and sifting with Samaritan Purse, canceling all your services for the house that was no longer there so you wouldn't get billed. It was a lot. 
10 months later, my daughter's ask from the fire from the start is to be able to go to her school, Lahaina Luna, up the road, get rid of the CD that played Shining Star during our escape, and not to live at our Lahaina Luna house because this was our second fire already and she doesn't feel safe, especially because it's all brush on the south side of our homes. Luckily, we have my mom's property to rebuild and live on. We were supposed to rent a place near the burn zone at the higher rent rates due to FEMA and greedy landlords mess. A friend offering 3,500 plus utilities, but not 5,000 at least. We then found out they were allergic to cats. It was a deal breaker. No one wants to rent to people with pets and we couldn't stay in the NCS program for much longer. We finally purchased a condo unit that a friend was selling at the appraised rate and not price gouging, which also allowed pets. 10 months after the fire, a lady who was volunteering and feeding cats in the burn zone scanned and found my two feral cats. They had escaped up above the bypass and made it. This made me super happy because every time I went back to my property, I would call for them because the unknown of if they made it. I no longer have to wonder or worry about them. Napili life out north, it is not home. We're here because we have to be. The one year date, there was a paddle out. I scattered my uncle's ashes that morning. I felt free and I felt he was free. We are still surviving. We now have to go through the whole process of rebuild, yet we've spent half of our money for the now and I am still filling out paperwork. Each person who has directly, who is directly in the line of that fire has an escape story like mine, and most are truly traumatic. I am grateful to have decided to go uphill as opposed to down that day. I thank my angels all the time for guiding me right. I've made some really good friends along the way, even with the mayor. I tell my daughter, my husband, and even my pets all the time, we made it. Thank you. So my name is Earl Kukahiko. I am a uh, lifelong resident of Lahaina. Uh, actually, one of very few left, I think, uh, born and raised in Lahaina, uh, in the old plantation, what they called the dispensary back then, which now we call a medical group, I guess. So uh, we lost four homes. My son lost his, my daughter lost hers. Uh, I lost, my wife and I lost ours, and my parents' home of almost 60 years also was burned to the ground. So I, I believe at, at this stage and why Mayor called me in was to represent uh, our kupuna, which is a term we use as elders in our community. Uh, I really didn't know I was a kupuna until Kaliko introduced me as kupuna in front of President Biden. And uh, at that point, I was kind of looking around, is my dad here? <laughs> but anyway, I, I coached Calico uh, in, in girls' fast pitch softball at a very young age and into her high school career. So I, I, I let it pass. But um, anyway, since the fire, uh, there, were, there were actually three tasks that, that I was impressed upon while also still learning still trying to learn to navigate, finding the balance between what was, what we now have, and what we need to move forward. First was creating that bridge between entities as we fought for water, as we continue to fight for water, housing, cultural recognition, and economic stability. I've come to learn there are so many different, so many different issues However, they all somehow overlap and intertwine with one another. Bringing those together in a safe and trustworthy space to share accomplishments, thoughts, and vision has been vital to how we proceed forward. Second, making sure things are done in a pono, righteous way. Kupuna do not have to be in the fight. There are many capable opio, as we call young people, warriors who have been on the ground doing it for a long time, some for many years. What we need as kupuna is to make sure that it is done in a pono way, 
with, his, with respect and compassion for one another. For example, we need to bring them to the table to stay in the conversation and not to just say your piece and leave, but to stay and listen to the other side. And we may have more in common than we thought. And lastly, is to instill hope in our community. We have been forced into multiple layers, phases, and levels of hope. You know, growing up, if we needed a definition, we'd go to the dictionary. Uh, today, my grandfather, my granddaughter, excuse me, told me, "People, Google." So, so this is Google's definition: hope, a feeling of expectation and a desire for a certain thing to happen. An optimistic state of mind that is based on an expectation of positive outcome with respect to events and circumstances in one's life. A feeling of trust. When challenges arise, making sure things not fall through the crack. Making sure people's anxieties are kept to a minimum. As we make new memories moving forward, we must learn from the bad ones and treasure the good ones. And together we can, and together we will build a better future, not with selfishness or greed, but with a cohesive understanding that we honor our past, live in safety and comfort in the present, and continue to build a solid legacy for future, gener future generations to follow. Mahalo Nui. Um, if you would picture this, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Johann Heinrich uh, Pestalozzi, Robert Owen, giants in the world of educational reform, each blazing their trail. Now, imagine a room filled with modern day trailblazers. Just look around, stepping off planes, out of cars, united by a single purpose. What fuels their journey? An unshakable belief that their voices will echo through these halls, sparking change that will ripple far beyond. Aloha mai kako. For 29 years, I stood in front of the classroom, guiding students through the world of science, history, English, and mathematics. But today, I stand before you in a new role as an assistant to Archie Kalepa, a soul whose very heartbeat echoes the rhythm of this land and its people. The wildfires that have ravaged our beloved Lahaina have ripped me from the classroom and thrust me into the ultimate test of our resolve, our aloha, and our collective strength. To those who have lost homes, livelihoods, and the cherished landscapes of childhood memories, I see your pain. It's etched into the charred faces of earth. But even in the ashes, I sense a fire within each of you, a flame that outburns any wildfire. We are the descendants of brave Pacific voyagers, of a people who built a thriving community on this sun-kissed land. Resilience courses through our veins. Resourcefulness is our birthright, and hope is the very core of who we are. Our kupuna taught us that every challenge conceals an opportunity, that every ending marks a new dawn. Now is the time to call upon the lessons we learned in the classroom and the living laboratory of this community. The lesson is that perseverance can shatter any obstacle, that together we can rebuild, restore, and emerge like the phoenix from the ashes. Just as our native forests lie dormant, awaiting the fires to clear the way for new growth, so too lies within us the power to rise anew. Archie Kalepa, my friend, my leader, my now boss, has a vision for our rebirth, a plan to heal our land and our hearts. I call upon you, my Ohana, to join hands with him, with me, with each other, 
Let us be the builders, the caretakers, the dreamers. Let Aloha be our compass as we navigate this journey. We will mourn, we will heal, and we will rise. For we are Lahaina, and this is our home. We will not be defined by loss, but by our response, our love, and our unwavering commitment to rebuild. Let the story of our resilience be the legacy we forge for generations to come. Mahalo. Aloha. My name is Nestor Ugali, and I sit on the Lahaina Advisory Committee for Mayor Rick Bisson. I joined in the beginning of December 2023, just four months after the devastating wildfires. With the all-star cast already assembled, I didn't believe I was adding much value to the team. However, the mayor convinced me otherwise. He assured me I would be adding the right dimension and perspective to an ever-changing landscape. As a son of Lahaina, born and raised, I consider myself very lucky. Like my own blood family, the community at large is as much responsible for who I am today. The geographical setup and isolated nature of Lahaina adds to the exclusivity and protectionism that is, for better or for worse, the identity of Lahaina and its community. Similar to most tourist destinations, real estate prices and gentrification forced me to move away from my hometown while commuting to and from Lahaina for economic reliance. In the wake of the fires, I found myself on the other side of a mountain, catching glimpses of photos, phone calls, and voicemails of horrific stories. With no steady stream of communication and a general idea of what was happening, those outside of Lahaina like myself who were paying attention had to piece together a sense of what was actually happening to a truly isolated town. The next week would not only alter the lives of those who lost everything, everything including family members, but on a personal note, it has altered how I conduct my day-to-day -day and has redirected the trajectory that is my purpose of being a Lahaina community member. Within the next 48 hours, my wife and I explored every option there was to join with other desperate groups, other desperate families to make our way into Lahaina. Without an address in Lahaina proper, I was prohibited from entering our own town. How was I to reach my brother and the rest of my family to ensure their safety? I ended up joining the efforts of local chefs who paired with a World Central Kitchen and earned my way in by delivering tens of thousands of hot meals to people with no homes, no cars, no electricity, no water, and no form of formal communication. The next three to six weeks felt like a blur. I was tired, but I kept going. My memory still, stop, still taps into the scent of charred cars and debris as I think about the elders hiding in homes that stood still, afraid, lonely, and without a clue in the world of what was to come. This work has been my driving force. Within the first week of disaster response, the pockets of survivors were being identified and cared for, and we noticed that there were still some pockets of communities that were still in dire need of attention, the immigrant community more specifically, the Filipino and Latino communities. I am a fourth generation Lahaina Filipino and I don't speak any Filipino languages, but I do understand a little bit. And as it turns out, Filipinos are the second largest ethnic group today in Lahaina and make up more than even half the students in our public education system. More Filipino lives were lost versus any other ethnic group. So naturally, my efforts focused on those neighborhoods because that's where I grew up. And that's where my family and friends live. Until power was restored, the fear and uncertainty, many people lived and affected their ability to trust outside aid. And my face, along with the crew that came along with me, were the only ones that entire neighborhoods trusted. As crucial infrastructure returned, housing aid stood up, federal and international aid began to pour in, I finally returned to my family. However, it wasn't long after that, people started to wonder, where are the Filipino people? Why aren't they showing up for help? And if there are such a large population, why are they still not showing up on our surveys and other data collection sheets? The perplexity of our Filipino community is still one that isn't fully understood, which is a huge problem. Since the invitation to join the mayor's advisory, 
I've been able to network and collaborate with government and non-government entities who aim to address all of the issues that affect everyone in the Filipino community. I have since stood up a nonprofit along with some dear friends of mine focusing on Filipinos and the immigrants in West Maui with the aim to addressing socioeconomic mobility, mental health and wellness, and the advancement in education and professional development. Born out of pure necessity, prior to this effort, there was a void of support to address our community in these ways. The name of our group is called Kaibigan ng Lahaina, or Friends of Lahaina. We realize the language access and cultural nuances often get forgotten in Western approaches to disaster response, and that we hope that we are able, by understanding, we can contail an approach that is softer, welcoming, and appropriate. It's through this foresight, understanding, and support of our Mayor Rick Bisson that a young professional leader in the community was even considered to join such platform, let alone feel empowered to organize and mobilize on behalf of such a large faction of our community. There are no words I can offer that will amount to the level of gratitude I have for him and his team. I apologize I am unable to join the conference. Mayor can tell you that I even had him write a, a mayor's note, like a parent note, to see if my boss would pay for my time away from work while I traveled to Sonoma to be with all of you. I just have to remember that going to work is also called resiliency building. And so someone has to keep this economy afloat. I just want to wish a maraming maraming salamat or thank you so very much for the opportunity to share my story, my involvement with Mayor Bissin and these amazing individuals. I pray that the work we do only adds to the amazing things that you all have already accomplished. Thank you. So I'm sure as you're looking through the schedule, you will notice that there is a big emphasis on Maui in particular. And I would like to really call that out in the fact that of all of the fires I've worked in in nearly seven years, it is the most complicated one by far. It's, it's the level of casualties, it's, it's also the level of loss, it's the most remote place on earth, it's all that you're hearing. And you know, we waited actually longer, four months to go in because we knew all these people had rushed in and I could not see what use we would be early in and we certainly didn't want to take up any rooms or space. So we started um, two months earlier, really making as many connections as we could, and then we came as a team. Many of the people who came with us are in this room today. And it was, for many of us, even though we should be hardened and wizened um, disaster people, it was intensely transformative. And when my husband picked me up from the airport, I was like, oh my god, honey, you don't even know. All these years, these, this thing I've been doing that keeps me going in this business, which is about humanity, right? I see it pop up in communities, and then maybe it pops right back down. But I'm like, oh, you don't understand. In Maui, they have names for it. It's normal. It's like they have names for how to do the right thing by each other. They have ohana. They have aina. They t it's about the land. And it was like finding a language that I did not even know existed um, because I had a lot to learn about Hawaii and I'm still doing that in Maui. But the people have taught every disaster professional that I know, even really wizened ones like Stan Gamont right there, Chris Smith, Jim Alvey, a lot of us, we came back from that trip differently because of the way that not only that we learned what we learned by listening, but also that they insisted on giving back to us, like through Native Hawaiian philanthropy, who were so nice, I almost cracked in half. I'm like, no, no, I'm here to be nice to you. If you're any nicer to me, I'm not going to survive it. But it was wonderful. So this is why, because I think we all have something to learn. It's not about the scope of the tragedy. It's really about the um, depth of the humanity and response, which encapsulates everything that we are ever trying to do in this work for each other. So I have some questions for you. We can go down the line. So it's obvious we know the fire hurt the community, and we've all been hurting with you and for you. But is there one thing that surprised you that it did actually that you could call a, I don't want to call it a positive, but like an unexpected outcome that felt right or a pride or something like that that came out of this moment? 
fine. You can say no. You can be like, I hate that question, Jennifer. It's fine. No problem. Um, I think it's just focused more on Lahaina and uncovered a lot of the problems, one being the water. Like I said, our fire hydrants did not have water. I literally just joked about this walking across to Whole Foods. I was teasing Amos in charge of me when I said, oh, look at this decoration over here. And he looked at it and I go, yeah, that's what we have in Lahaina because they don't have water. And so moving forward, what are we going to do about it? Because um, my biggest thing was because there was no water, I felt the fire should have gone straight down towards the ocean, but it went out sideways. And so there was no way of stopping it. it you, could, you just had to kind of watch it, I think. And so moving forward and for me wanting to move back home, I can't move back home until it's figured out. And I am hope to find more information out here about it. Okay. Yeah, but right. it uncovered that for me. That, that's a good thing. Though. Yes. Okay. What is hopeful for me uh, is one part of my line of work is I work in conservation uh, at Pu'ukukui Watershed. And, and I was raised around a Hawaiian family that had a Hawaiian perspective and aina and kai are important to us. And um, the beautiful thing about this is sometimes when you're doing aina work and you're the, that one small group way back in the mountain that nobody sees, maybe they hear about you, maybe they hear you're growing some trees, planting some taro. Um, but now, the beautiful thing is everybody wants to plant a tree. Everybody wants to learn about how to plant food. What, what can sustain me? And so you just start to hear the buzz throughout the town and in Hawaiian, you know, our, our children go to Hawaiian immersion, uh, Kulakaya Puni, and in that setting, through Hawaiian language and Hawaiian perspective, we teach the children how to be grounded. Now that nowadays they call it, oh, let's go get grounded. What? Oh my gosh! In in Hawaii, to be grounded is to take off your slippers and get into a taro patch and take care of the things that feed you. So we we come out the womb thinking that perspective, and today we have nowhere to go but up. So you may as well get your hands in the ground, your butt in the air, and get to planting because the more talking that we've done over the years, and that just wastes, wastes time. But today, now we can talk and plant and eat and watch things grow all at the same time. Very, very hopeful. We will never starve. And our kupuna say, hai hai no kaua i kaulu lao. The rain will follow the forest. We see it, right? The forest is way up at the summit, but no, really, the forest is halfway down in the music forest because the rain is starting to follow the trees that are a no water system. It is on the rain that comes from the top of the mountain, and it's nearly right above Honolulu Bay. So can you tell I get excited? I'm very hopeful because everybody's going to have food, and, and the water will come the more trees we plant. Okay, well, kupuna brain, so I hope I answer your question that you asked. But uh, for me, I, I kind of grew up in the, the plantation, pineapple picking era. Uh, both my parents worked at, uh, in the school system, actually. And so we were pretty much sheltered from a lot of the, the cultural uh, significance. Uh, so... It was a really rude awakening, learning a lot of the things that, is, that we're now experiencing culturally, uh, as well as economically. And so, like Laurie mentioned, water. I, I didn't realize. I was always wondering why I had to stop watering my yard, but then the golf courses were nice and green out there. And so... It's not that we don't have enough water, it's just we're restricted to our residents. We only have 22% that actually went to the residents. The rest all went to private, private entities. So those are some, I think, the wake-up calls. One of the things that we are working on is that with this fire, we have a chance to press a restart button. 
and to try and fix and repair. We're not going to have everything done the way we want or the way that it should be, but we can at least start the process for our future generation to, to prosper and to continue. The other shocking thing I learned just recently is that there's only 16% of homeowners that actually live on the property that they have that in Lahaina. So how can we get our young people back on the Aina to afford being a resident living on your property? So again, these are a lot of the challenges that we are working, working towards and hopefully we can accomplish. So one of the hopeful discussions that um, I've been a witness to with Archie um, and the housing um, discussions that have been going on and would be the financial, um, the financial mindset. So putting his question to me was, how come so many people, when they get their their lease or their name gets called up for DHHL, Department of Hawaiian Homelands, they don't qualify for their mortgage. And they say they've been waiting on the list for 20 plus years. And I said, well, it's because there wasn't a, a financial mindset change over the 20 years. And so the literacy for finances has to change and what's being written into a few of the housing projects that we're working on, private housing projects, is a financial literacy program. And that would help the OPO or anyone that is buying help to change that mindset. So I believe that that's part of it as well. And one of the discussions that we did have early on when the White House had sent a contingency out about a year ago was that many of the homeowners were underinsured because I'm sure that that was a problem here too. No one told us that you know wildfire insurance was needed. So there wasn't a fire engine that was gonna respond to the, to the homes within 15 minutes because they couldn't get there. So that was another issue. So I believe the educational process now is also changing. So I am hopeful because in two weeks, the superintendent and the CASs are all the the uh, area superintendents are going to be visiting the um, the Lahaina complex, and I'm on that front end, you know. So even though it broke my heart to walk away from my classroom a week after uh, the fire had happened, and that was by choice because of who I was going to begin working for, I am putting myself and becoming very hopeful that that system that the Department of Education system that I felt was imploding, um, I put myself on that front line because that's where it begins. It's, it's literacy. So there is where I find, again, there's so many things that this fire, this wildfire has illuminated for us to deal with and we have, we're, we're being forced to even look at it from so many different angles and this has allowed us to, so I do mahalo our mayor who you know, I was, had the privilege of teaching his grandson, who today is thriving, but when he was in my classroom, I got all the stories, and he is like, unlike, and not, not unlike any other student that I've had, but my job was to create that spark, and that same thing is going to happen in a week from now when we converge all these canoes in the ocean, which is where the heart of the matter starts with all of our kiki in Lahaina, and they get to get out there and swim to the canoe, touch the canoe, learn how our ancestors used that to get to where we are. And that's the literacy. So it goes from the very top to the bottom and in preparation. So I believe it starts with literacy in so many areas. So we do need to get them to own those homes and the housing projects that um, Archie's working on, that's a component that we've been that he's been weaving in there as well. Thank you. 
I did want to say that um, one of the things we love the most in this organization is what we call an emergent leader, which are people who did not have like an official role before the fire, but take on an outsized leadership role after the fire. We, and I would consider having a mayor's advisory council of not your biggest fans, a very much a best practice that I would like to see um, more communities adopt because then they're not afraid to tell you what's true and what's needed. These are emergent leaders who were already had social capital in the community, and so it was a very smart thing to do, and they're a big part of the reason, including many of these people in this, in this room, of why um, the federal government has even bent to the will of Maui in ways that are wonderful, and I would like to thank all of you for your really hard work and for coming here to Sonoma to be with us. Thank you. Thank you.